Hello, everybody, um, and uh, welcome to this ISN ISPD webinar um, on incremental PD, personalized PD. And uh, I really hope that you all find the webinar informative and interesting, and I look forward to some great discussion and questions at the end. My name is Jeff Crowell. I'm a nephrologist at St. Michael's Hospital at the University of Toronto, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. And we have some excellent speakers today. I'd like to take the opportunity to introduce both of them. The first speaker will be Professor Edwina Brown, whose research interests are in dialysis outcomes, particularly in older people and renal palliative care. And she was the principal investigator for the uh, FEPOD study, uh, looking at assisted peritoneal dialysis outcomes compared to hemodialysis. She has um, a CV that is exceptionally impressive among which include president-elect of the ISPD, chair of the ISPD Guidelines Committee with a, a real driving force behind the uh, most recent high-quality PD delivery guidelines, um, which were recently published last year. And it is a pleasure to invite her today to speak on uh, incremental PD, along with Dr. Peter Blake, who is a professor of medicine at um, the Western University in London, Ontario, and a staff nephrologist at London Health Science Centre. He's the Provincial Medical Director of the Ontario Renal Network and Chair of the ISN CME Committee since 2019, and member uh, of the uh, ISPD work group who uh, worked towards the uh, PD high-quality prescribing guidelines. So we have a really exciting webinar for you today on incremental PD. Our objectives today are to provide practical examples of how incremental PD is prescribed, to really distinguish between incremental PD and other PD prescribing strategies, including palliative or low clearance non-incremental PD, and uh, importantly, to appreciate how person-centered care principles can interact with incremental PD strategies. I want to remind you that the Q&A is open throughout the webinar. I'll be curating some of the questions throughout the webinar, and uh, we'll, be having, we'll have an opportunity to ask the speakers those questions at the end. I also may answer some of the questions throughout the webinar um, as we move forwards. So just to get things going, I just want to point out that some background reading on incremental PD was an article written by Drs. Blake, Dong, and Davies. Um, and I want to put a plug in for Peritoneal Dialysis International as part of an ISPD membership. You have access to PDI, and uh, PDI has some very informative and exciting articles in the area of peritoneal dialysis. And so just to start things off before we, uh, in, before we have our first speaker, just a poll question now. Do you currently prescribe incremental PD? And the answers are yes, no, and I don't really know what incremental PD is. So here we go. 52% said yes, 21% said no, and 27% said I don't really know what incremental PD is. Okay, so for the 27%, you will certainly hopefully know by the end of today's webinar. And for the 21%, I hope today's webinar gives you some food for thought on strategies to prescribe incremental PD you could consider. And with that, I'd like to introduce Edwina Brown, today's first lecture. Hello. Um, and thanks, Jeff, for the um, kind introduction, and th um, thanks to ISN and ISPD for putting on this um, webinar about this really important topic. And I like to think about incremental PD as really being personalised PD. These are just my conflicts of interest. So what I'm going to be talking about is the really the dialysis journey in gold directed dialysis delivery, shared decision making, some potential pitfalls and barriers, what is the evidence of and any outcomes that we know about from incremental PD, and, and a, a couple of very small examples. So one of the things we tend to forget as physicians um, and healthcare workers in dialysis is the huge burden of dialysis, even when one is doing dialysis at home. Um, and the advantages of um, incremental PD is that really we can hopefully do something about not leaving the patient or the person doing dialysis feeling quite so isolated and alone um, carrying this burden um, as this um, man in, in this photo. 
So when you start dialysis, um, and this is my attempts at computer graphics, which are not wonderful. The red line um, shows um, residual kidney function, um, and, and you, you know, this is when you have all, all the symptoms. Uh, and, and the other bars really show burden of dialysis. So the orange bar is standard prescription, and the green bar is incremental prescription. So when you start dialysis, you've still got residual kidney function. It's rather like stepping off a cliff. So there you are one day being a completely normal person doing normal activities. And then the next day you're having to do bag changes or you're uh, having to sleep with a machine by, by your bed. Uh, and, and that is a big burden and a big change in lifestyle. The advantages of incremental um, prescriptions is that that burden can be minimized and then gradually increased as the kidney function goes down. And there's a lot of evidence about the burden of dialysis and its impact on quality of life. And really one of the biggest studies comes from um, the PDOPS and DOPS study that um, Jeff Pearl and I have just published in American Journal of Kidney Disease, and, and the blue in, in all of these outcomes is um, severe, um, you know, burden of dialysis, poor physical function, etc. And, and that is, uh, and the, bar, the bars on the left are hemodialysis, and the bars on the right are in peritoneal dialysis. And what is really the has the biggest impact on burden of dialysis or all of the outcomes, um, quality of life outcomes, is your functional status. So people with poor functional status are going to have a poor quality of life, whether they're on hemodialysis or peritoneal dialysis. And we need to address this so that quality of life on dialysis is as good as possible. And one of the ways of doing that is by reducing the burden um, by incremental prescribing. Now, it, Jeff mentioned the um, concept of goal-directed dialysis, and, and that is um, what is the focus of the ISPD um, practice and prescribing um, recommendations. And this was first floated at the KDIGO meeting um, about three years ago, uh, and and what this figure shows is on the blue side it are um, things that are impacted by dialysis and on the green side of the figures, things that are not impacted by dialysis. So, and as you can see, the majority of factors which impact on somebody's well-being are not within the realms of, of dialysis uh, treatment. And that's the background to the practice recommendations which were published last year and are open access on the ISPD website. And the principal um, recommendation of this practice um, guideline is that one should be aiming for high quality goal directed dialysis, um, that peritoneal dialysis should be prescribed using shared decision making. Uh, between the person doing PED, their caregivers, and the care team to achieve realistic care goals, maximize quality of life and satisfaction for the person, minimize their symptoms, and provide high quality care. So alongside the uh, main uh, recommendations were a whole series of supporting papers, and you've already seen uh, in the introduction um, by Jeff, the paper that was published by Peter Blake, Xi Dong, and Simon Davis um, on incremental peritoneal dialysis. So incremental prescribing is a strategy which is less than standard full dose PD um, and is prescribed when people start on dialysis. And it's done with the intention to increase the PD prescription when the residual kidney function goes down. It is not a reduced prescription because of financial constraints or because of palliative care. 
I've just listed here a few examples. I'm not going to go through these because uh, Peter Blake's talk is really going to be um, lots of examples of how different prescriptions are used when doing incremental prescribing. Now, what's absolutely key um, to the incremental PD pathway is the shared decision making so that the prescription that is being given, um, being set for an individual, uh, is increased as the kidney function goes down and the prescription fits into the lifestyle of the patient. So, um, as we've said, uh, you, you, you reduce the prescription when somebody starts on dialysis to uh, allow for the residual kidney function and that person is on CAPD or APD um, as it fits into their lifestyle and, and depending on individual countries' resources. Often many of my patients will start on two exchanges, um, five days a week, sometimes three exchanges, um, six days a week if, if they've um, got a, a lower residual kidney function. I very, very rarely start anybody on seven days a week. And then when you see people in the clinic, uh, it, it's important to assess their well-being, look at blood tests, consider do they need to increase their dialysis and would this be of any benefit? If you think that there's going to be no benefit and no need to increase, obviously you don't change anything. But if you feel that, yes, somebody needs a bigger prescription, again, you have shared decision making about how does that person want their prescription to be increased and what's going to fit into their lifestyle. You don't need to go immediately up to um, full prescription. Um, there's a whole range of, of gradations that, um, that you can use. But what's really key to all of this is recognizing the failing to thrive patient. Uh, and this is all um, itemized in, in the um, paper that in, in um, perineal dialysis international and in the practice recommendations. So how is somebody? Just ask them. What's their hospitalization rate? What's their volume status? Uh, what's their solute removal? Um, do their blood tests suggest they're becoming uremic? Um, KTO with um, urea is useful as a measurement of dose, but it is definitely not a target um, that we should be aiming for. And remember that there are many non-dialysis factors that are going to impact on somebody's well-being and increasing the amount of dialysis is not going to um, Im improve those. Then factors that are going to really make you feel that increasing dialysis may be a benefit. It are, is somebody becoming uremic? Are they symptomatically volume overloaded? Are they having hospitalizations related to uremia or volume overload? Do they, um, are they losing residual kidney function? Um, what is their small solute removal? And then supported by biochemical features such as high potassium, high phosphate, um, et cetera. But remember that we are um, looking after an individual. And as well as the dialysis, that individual has many other things going on in their lives. And this wonderful painting, which is in the art gallery in Tel Aviv in Israel by Marc Chagall, really got me to think um, about how do you talk about an individual. So you need to rethink about their culture, their ethnicity, their religion, their spirituality, what's their job, um, are they living in a city, are they living in the country, um, etc. So to make incremental PD a success, I think what really underlies that is, first of all, patient education. They need to understand that you're starting them on a low dose, but as time goes on, just like pre-dialysis, their kidney function will continue to go down. And that as that happens, they will need more dialysis. So they're not taken by surprise when that happens. So at clinics, um, it's really important to assess um, the well-being of the person. Um, if there's a concern, 
and just realistically consider whether increasing dialysis is going to improve the well-being. And your time that you're spending with the patient needs to include um, time for shared decision making. Um, talk through different regimes. Do they want to go up to three exchanges? Do they want to go up to seven days a week? Do they want to change to APD? And how's this going to affect their lifestyle? Um, how's it going to affect um, the lifestyle of any caregivers or family members um, who may be helping them? And you know, and you're going to, and often it's better to do this in small steps um, rather than big ones because. Uh, a sudden change uh, can be quite um, difficult for somebody to agree to. So what are the barriers and challenges in implementing incremental PD? Well, on the patient side, uh, it, it's really if, if they start missing routine clinic reviews, so you, you don't notice that the, they're losing residual kidney function, if they don't bring in 24-hour urine, you don't actually need a clearance test. What's really important is the 24-hour urine collection, um, so you can have some idea of residual kidney function. If the patient or caregiver, whether it's family or paid, is unwilling to support more exchanges or change to APD. Um, and this was a particular challenge um, during the COVID peaks, uh, when it, settlements were all being done by telephone and some my patients were actually quite reluctant to leave their home for blood tests. On the healthcare team side, the decision making with somebody um, each time you change a prescription does take time and obviously you also need to take time to educate the patient and I have conversations quite regularly about um, even if I think people are stable is to say well you know the, it's just I think that your kidney function is beginning to go down and next time you come, we may have to start thinking about should we go up to three exchanges, etc. So that they're not completely taken by surprise. Um, and also the other challenge to nephrology teams is that clinical decision making is now about somebody's well-being and not an automatic reflex um, when you see the KT over V result. So what about evidence and, um, and, and what actually happens in real life? So as I've said, this is my own practice here. We've been doing this um, for a long time now. Um, this was, we published this data um, earlier this year uh, and it, it's a review of patients we started PD between 2012 and 2016, so you know it's from 10 years ago. And and as you can see, um, this is um, baseline. Uh, it's quite, about 50% of my patients started at that time on less than seven days a week. Now it's probably about 90% are starting on less than seven days a week. Uh, and many of those patients who started on seven days a week at this time were, were had their dose reduced after their first clearance test result. So that by three months, as you can see, only about a quarter of patients were on seven days a week. Um, and uh, and even at three years, a third of only a third of patients were on seven days a week. I always tell people, none of us want to work seven days a week. So why on earth do we make patients still do their peritoneal dialysis seven days a week if, if they can um, be managed with having a day off? And if they've still got some urine, they can easily have a day off dialysis. As you can see, we also measured uh, creatinine clearance um, and the majority of these patients, you know, over 80, even at three years, over 85% still had a creatinine clearance of over 50 litres a week um, and they had um, good fluid removal of over 750 mils in 24 hours. So what we looked at this data was uh, was the impact on time to technique failure. And 
in the uh, multivariate Cox regression, the only predictor of time to technique failure was the um, reduced PD compared to standard. So the time to technique failure was much lower. There was, was the risk of, of having technique failure was much lower in the um, reduced PD compared to the standard PD prescription. In other words, those on incremental PD had a better technique survival, which in a way is not surprising um, because there's going to be less burnout uh, as people um, are having days off. So what happened during the COVID time? Uh, on the bars on the left um, show the huge growth that we have had in our own PD program um, during COVID. Um, this was partly um, because people did not want to start hemodialysis um, because of the risk of getting COVID in the hemodialysis units. But at the same time, we were actively giving people days off. And, uh, and at long last, we had managed to um, get our pre-dialysis nurses to understand that people did not start on seven days a week. They automatically were only doing dialysis five or six days a week. Um, and this message was being given to patients who then uh, much more readily um, chose peritoneal dialysis. So as you can see in the, the graph on, in the right on the top one, actually the orange are those who start on seven days a week. Very few of the patients were starting PD on seven days a week. Toronto General Hospital, so Joanne Bartman's unit, um, is another centre which has been actively um, prescribing um, in incremental PD um, and again has just published their data. So very similar numbers of patients, they, they, these have got 175 um, and, and again the majority of her patients start on, on a reduced dose and only 30 um, out, out of, you know, just over the 200 patients um, were started on a full dose. Um, and this graph on the right shows how the dose of dialysis was gradually increased over time. <coughs> So this is over five years. Um, she found that the duration to full dose prescription uh, was the mean median was 15 months, um, with the interquartile ranges being 8.1 to 26.2. Um, and she also looked at what the um, predictors for increasing the dose up to six liters uh, or more, which was her definition of no longer being a, a reduced dose um, by 12 months. And the predictors were male sex, uh, a higher BMI or a higher serum albumin. So just two very quick examples. This is a 75 year old man with polycystic kidneys um, who liked going to classical concerts um, and including standing um, at the prom, the proms concerts in the Royal Albert Hall. He spent a long time dithering about cho choosing hemo or PD and eventually started on PD two exchanges for six days. He's now aged 82 um, and we have gradually increased his dialysis. So he's doing three exchanges seven days a week. He continues to pass urine. Um, he does have um, a low KTO ravine, a slightly high phosphate. Um, he can't go to concerts um, because of COVID, uh, but he does, then I quite frequently meet him um, and his friends in on my daily walks. So would you change his PD prescription? Um, I haven't because I think putting him up to four exchanges would certainly impact his ability to do his three mile walk every day. And this is a man who uh, presented very late with CKD5, 33 year old African man on a background of hypertension. They just had a second child. He was working in a coffee shop. I um, had a very tiny crowded apartment and he was very reluctant um, to have APD. So we started him on three exchanges six days a week. He clearly needed um, quite a bit of dialysis. His creatinine was about over a thousand. 
Um, he initially did very well. He managed to continue working. The COVID then happened. He missed an appointment and he came to the clinic really quite uremic um, and dreadful blood tests. And we put him up to four exchanges seven days a week and he's clinically much improved. Um, and he has in fact now changed to APD with a daytime dwell. But again, only six days a week, he still gets his day off. So incremental PD um, or personalized PD, I think is the key to goal-directed and individualization of the PD prescription. It involves the patient in setting the PD prescription um, and hopefully maybe therefore increases the concordance with that prescription. You know, by allowing somebody to have a day off, actually, all our patients probably take a day off anyway without telling us. I'd much rather know that they're doing it. Uh, and uh, and uh, I don't really have much evidence that many of them are taking more days off um, than what's prescribed. On the questions that people um, submitted before the webinar, somebody asked whether you could have two days off um, those who are doing say to five days whether they can have them consecutively and the answer is yes again it depends on the, um, the urine output um, but, but quite a few of my patients will take the whole weekend off um, or they'll take the days off uh, depending on what shift pattern they're working on they work it round um, what's convenient for them the prescription focuses on the well-being and lifestyle of the patient and then there's the side issues. Um, it reduces the quantity of fluid being used and delivered to the patient. That reduces costs, which is good for the healthcare system. It's less plastic, smaller deliveries, and that's good for the environment. Um, but success um, does depend on partnership between the patient and healthcare team. And we definitely need more good evidence, particularly around quality of life, duration of residual kidney function, and acceptability of PD to people making choices about dialysis modality. Thank you. That's the end of my talk. And we'll pass over now to Peter Blake, um, who's going to give you examples of how incremental PD is actually used. Uh, this case is a 52 year old woman who is on cycler PD for polycystic kidney disease. She doesn't go to Dr. Brown's unit, so she's on a full prescription. She starts on five two-liter cycles at night and a two-liter day dwell. But at, and at three months, she has her clearances measured and they're excellent with a KT, sorry, it's a KT and V of 3.1. So by any standards, excellent dialysis. She has a, a peritoneal KT and V of 1.8 and quite a lot of residual function, as many people do in the first three months. She feels well, her volume status is good, and maybe she's read about incremental PD, maybe she's read Dr. Brown's article because she asks, can she stop using the day dwell? Can she go day dry? Next, please. Uh, next slide, thank you. So she's asking, the prescription is shown in cartoon form above. She's asking, can she drop the day dwell uh, and move from the lower prescription to the higher day dry prescription shown on this slide. Next, please. So I'm giving you some choices. Bad idea, you can't get too much dialysis. You can't get too much of a good thing. Two, bad idea, you need middle molecule clearance, which comes from the day dwell. Bad idea, you're going to need that day dwell eventually, so why don't you get used to it now? Our good idea, go day dry. Next slide, please. So as you can see here, I'm choosing go day dry. I think this is a good idea. And this lady is moving, therefore, to an incremental PD prescription. I started on full dose PD. In Edwina Brown's unit and in my unit, we would have started her in the first place on this. Next, please. So this is the prescription she's now on. Next, please. And remember the definition of incremental PD. There are three, three components to it. One, you should be on less than a standard prescription. So a standard CAPD, we consider four two liter bags daily. Standard APD, we consider eight liters daily or more, including at least one day dwell. 
So this, you, you earn less than that. You have a peritoneal clearance that's less than the goal clearance, and you're using the residual renal clearance to achieve the goal. The goal was traditionally 1.7. Many patients, that still applies. You have flexibility nowadays in what your goal is going to be for your patient. The third and key item is that there must be a clear intention to increase the peritoneal clearance if and when total clearance falls below the goal. Uh, and that's essential to this. Next slide, please. So in this lady, you switch her to five two-liter dwells daily, but crucially, and I've stated it here in, in highlighted font, you tell her you will advise her to resume the day dwell if she loses her remaining renal function. So one month later, you measure her clearance again, and it's still super, super good. It's 2.5 now, down from 3.1, but still ahead of any target. And you'll notice now it's made up of a peritoneal of 1.2 and a residual of 1.3. In other words, the residual is taking that person over the target, which we'll say is 1.7, and moving her from 1.2 right up to 2.5. She remains very well and she's happier now because she doesn't carry fluid during the daytime, which many people don't, don't wish to. The question arises, could you do even more for her? Because still she's got a very high clearance. Next, please. So, next, uh, next, next one, please. So, choices here, no change. You've done enough already. The other extreme, you might say, could you stop dialysis altogether? But if you look at her residual renal function of only it's equivalent to 1.2 a week, KT and V, it's not enough to do that. But how about a night off each week, like, like Edwina offers her patients? Or maybe this, this patient might prefer instead to reduce her time on the cycler to seven or eight hours from, from nine, say. Or would she prefer a less of a dwell volume? Everyone is different, and this is where shared decision-making and education come into it. Next, please. Uh, so in this case, uh, how about a night off each week was her choice, and that was another bonus for her. And the right answer really, though, was patient choice. Let her choose one of these, not stopping dialysis altogether, because that, that's, she doesn't have enough clearance to do that. So this is an example of how you can apply the principles of incremental PD. Next, please. Here's a, a CAPD patient. I'll go more quickly through this one. Same sort of story. He's on the full prescription and he asks, can he go down to three dwells daily? Again, he's a person with a very high KTMV of 2.8 a week because he's both got lots of peritoneal clearance and, and quite a lot of residual clearance. Next, please. And again, I give you the options and I'll get to the point here really. Uh, you can go, it's a good idea, I'm saying, go down to three dwells daily. Um, next, please. And this is the three two liters daily prescription that is very common in people who are on incremental PD, incremental CAPD in this case. Next, please. Again, um, you tell this person that you will advise him to resume a full prescription if he loses renal function. That's the essence of incremental. If you're just going to continue in the lower prescription, it's different. One month later, he's still doing well. He's 2.4. It's a mix of 1.2 peritoneal and 1.2 residual renal. He's happy. He's less procedures, and he says he feels well. Again, I'm going to ask you, could you help him more? You probably could. He's still at 2.4 and he's very well. This is not a race to the bottom, but it's an effort to make life a little more bearable uh, and to lessen the burden that Edwina talked about that people on dialysis face. Next, please. So again, these are the choices. He can't stop dialysis altogether, but I don't necessarily agree that no further change is right. You might, if you thought it would help him, and you might discuss this with him, go down to two two liters uh, a day, or three 1.5s, if that was a particular issue, or again, the day off a week, which I think is very attractive. Next, please. And again, that's the one he chose, and the patient, that's patient choice. This is CAPD two dwells a day. Now, a problem with two dwells a day, of course, is that you may start to resorb uh, some fluid with, uh, with, if you're using glucose-based PD, 
and you may absorb quite a lot of glucose too. Next, please. So you'll often do this using icodextrin uh, for one or even both of those dwells. It's not officially approved. Many physicians do it. It is a, it is a little bit expensive, depending which country you're in. Next, please. So these are an examples of common CAPD and APD incremental prescriptions that we've sort of reviewed in these two cases. So there's all sorts of options, as you can see. Many centers tend to pick the same pattern most of the time, but patients are different and sometimes they'll prefer one option to another. Next, please. Case three is a 70-year-old man who starts CAPD. He's got a nephrologist who doesn't believe KT and V is important or that the evidence in the published literature supports it. He doesn't measure KT and V. He thinks it's a, a, a science without any background to it. So he puts the patient on three two-liter bags a day and the patient is doing well. Is this incremental PD? So next slide, please. So my answer here is, well, you've got three choices. Yes, he's less than, on less than full PD prescription. No, there is no clearance goal or target. So the concept of incremental PD doesn't even apply. He's not got a clearance goal. And third option, no intention to increase PD clearance if residual function declines. Next slide, please. So I would say the two no answers are both right. There's two reasons that they're not in incremental. This is a doctor who rightly or wrongly doesn't believe in clearance, so there's no target clearance. The whole concept doesn't apply. And secondly, there's no intention to increase PD clearance if, he lose, if the patient loses residual function. So this is what I would call low clearance PD. It's not incremental PD. In some countries, people do this because there isn't enough the patient is paying themselves, say, and hasn't enough money to support a full prescription. Are the health service rations dialysis? Are the doctor, as in this case, doesn't believe in, P, in, in KT and V in the first place? Next, please. Here's another one. This lady is 80 years of age. She's been on uh, PD for the last two years. She's on a, a, a low frequency cycling prescription, three two liter bags at night and a day dwell, and then an evening dwell as well, what some people call high-dose PD or PD+, plus, depending on which company you work with. This, uh, this prescription is quite common. This lady has been on this for two years, uh, but she has worsening heart failure, low blood pressure, her health is deteriorating, she's losing her eyesight, and she's going deaf. Quality of life is very poor, she tells us, and the patient, and she finds PD very a uh, high burden, very hard work. Not very happy, this lady. Next, please. And this is what she's doing. And um, next, please. And you discuss discontinuation of dialysis with her because you think this lady's quality of life is just so poor, why would she want to continue? But she tells you that her husband and her two daughters would be very upset if she stopped dialysis. And she's just not ready to do that. But she says, Doc, could I have less dialysis and skip a few days a week? Could you give me a little bit of time off, maybe a day off a week, and could I stop doing all these exchanges? Next, please. So you decide that you will do, you will help her. You decide just leave her on the cycler at night, a one liter day dwell, and you give her a whole 24 hours off a week and she passes away. She makes life a bit easier for her and her family who are helping her with the dialysis, but she passes away from heart disease after four months. She's not dying of uremia, she's dying of cardiac disease. Next, please. Question uh, I would ask, is this low-dose PD prescription a form of incremental PD? Was that incremental PD that you did? Yes, the prescription is less than full cycler, or no, it doesn't meet the definition. Next, please. And the answer, I would say, is no, it doesn't meet the definition. First of all, clearances were no longer the issue here. You were reducing the prescription. There was no intent to increase regardless of a residual renal function. This was a lifestyle-driven decision, which had nothing to do with clearance targets or future intentions to increase the prescription. Next, please. This is what I would call, uh, so it doesn't meet, uh, it doesn't meet uh, number two or number three in the definition that the ISPD provided. Next, please. Uh, this is called palliative PD by some people. Uh, some, uh, it's basically uh, an alternative 
in somebody who doesn't want to stop dialysis altogether, who is not ready to pass away, but whose quality of life is more important than any clearance conceptual target. The person is often dying slowly, and you want to help rather than hinder them in getting some quality of life in their last few months, perhaps. Next, please. And in a sense, um, this could be called decremental PD. You're actually, it's the opposite in some ways. It has the same intention as incremental PD to improve the patient's quality of life, but it is, uh, it's going in the opposite direction to some extent. It's decremental PD and very patient-centered, but not incremental. Next, please. Uh, we can do it in hemodialysis as well. I had a patient recently who wanted to go down to twice a week. She was dying with stomach cancer. There was no hope for her. It was, she was a palliative patient as far as the cancer team was concerned, but she did not want to stop dialysis and her family didn't want to. So again, I, di I, I did the same thing with HD. So it's an alternative to stopping dialysis for those who are not quite ready or able, but want their, their therapy burden reduced. Next, please. Uh, here's another case, 60-year-old man with diabetes, hypertension, and intractable heart failure. Creatinine is, by uh, dialysis standards, is quite low, 220, doesn't appear to need dialysis. His EGFR is 27. His urea is relatively higher at 36, and he's resistant to diuretics. His doctor uh, says, let's try PD. This is using PD to treat fluid overload in the absence of full-scale uremia. And it's practiced, I think, to a significant extent in many centers. We always have a few people doing this on dialysis in our program. So he started on just one icodextrin a day. Next, please. And that's the prescription he does. He leaves the icodextrin in all night. And of course, it doesn't tend to get resorbed. And indeed, after 12 hours, he'll often have quite a bit of fluid in the back, extra fluid removed. Next, please. So he gets about 500 mils a day off, and he has about 1.3 liters of urine output with all the diuretics. So his edema actually resolves and his condition improves. Somebody measures his KT and V and after six weeks, and it's very high because he still has a lot of residual function, as you saw. His EGFR, he was a, a CKD4, not a CKD5, 2.85 a week, and it's almost all coming from his residual renal function. The peritoneal clearance provided by the one icodextrin is small, 0.4 a week, about towards the target. Is this incremental PD? Next slide, please. And here are the options. Yes, it's low clearance PD, and the addition of the residual renal puts his clearance in excess of any target. Second, no, there is no stated intention to increase the clearance if residual renal function falls. Third answer, no, this is not a case of uremia, and the whole issue is not clearance, and so the, the principle of incremental PD doesn't really apply here. Next, please. And again, I'd say the third one is correct here, to some extent the second, but the, it's even more fundamental here. We are not dialyzing for uremia. Clearance targets are not the point here, volume status is. So this is not incremental PD. Again, it's useful therapy sometimes, but that's not what it is. Here's another case, a little similar, but a little different. This man has also got cardiac disease. He uh, has a cardiomyopathy. He's fluid overload, but he has some uremic symptoms too. Look at his blood work. His creatinine is 500. His EGFR is 9, his urea is 36, he's resistant, like the last man, to diuretics. Again, you start him on one icodextrin a day. Next, please. Fluid is removed at about, uh, similar to the last case, about half a liter a day with the icodextrin, and he gets also 1.3 liters off through his urine. And like the last patient, he also improves. When you do his KT and V after six weeks, it's 2.0, comprising 1.6 residual and 0.4 peritoneal. Is this incremental PD? Next, please. And yes, it is, as long as there's a goal level of clearance. And you have a clearance goal likely here because you, you're dealing with someone who has end-stage renal failure. His, his EGFR was low, his CKD5. There is a goal level of clearance. You're trying to improve that. 
So it is, as long as you have a goal clearance and as long as a clear intention to increase peritoneal clearance, once his residual function declines. Next, please. Uh, six months later, his residual function has indeed declined. His KTMV is now down. He's also fluid overloaded again. He may be somewhat uremic. You add a second icodextrin date well, and the UF goes up, and his KTNV goes up. You're now practicing incremental PD. Next, please. And this is the prescription I showed you it earlier. He's on it now with two icodextrin, each in for 12 hours a day, approximately. Next, please. So in summary, we've, I've shown you five or six cases, some were incremental, some were not, all emphasize the notion that PD is not uniform or standard for everybody, that you achieve what you want to do, working with the patient, shared decision-making, as Edwina Brown said, patient-centered care. It's a little bit more work for you in some ways. You have to think more. You can't just do formulate prescription. But I think it's good care. And very importantly, it's less work for the overburdened patient and the overburdened caregivers in some case. And the literature, there are not many trials done in this. Uh, there is a lot of observational studies. There is one small randomized trial that shows less peritonitis with incremental CAPD. But there's no signal, no evidence of any downside. And from my experience, I think the, uh, this is helping patients find the burden of dialysis much more tolerable. And that's very welcome. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, uh, Peter and Edwina, for two um, excellent discussions, a really uh, practical end. And, and Edwina, thank you for the, the background and a lot of inf important information on incremental PD. The questions from the chat um, have been rolling through. And so uh, I'm just going to ask Peter a question. Uh, one of the um, participants asks, when we talk about CAPD three exchanges a day, are we talking about three exchanges over a 24-hour period? or could incremental PD include three exchanges with a dry period in that 24 hours for CAPD? Mostly it's three exchanges spread over the day, but you could of course do that. There used to be something called DAPD, which you may it's almost never use now, where you had three exchanges during the day and nothing at nighttime. It was sometimes used when people were resorbing the long exchange and there was no icodextrin option but I rarely see that now, uh, but you could. And uh, uh, as long as you, if, if clearance is an issue, you need to leave the bag each exchange in at least four or five hours to get the value of the clearance. Yeah. Uh, if you're doing CAPD three uh, for two hours each, it's, it's not very clever, really. Uh, you'd be better to do less, less exchanges and longer dwells in that situation. So anything goes, but I would say in general, you use most, if not all of the 24 hours a day. But you can, you could come up with something that you lose, uses only 16 hours a day. And if you have a good bit of residual function, it'll probably work. Right. Okay, great. Um, question for Edwina. Um, so one of the things is you, you did talk a lot about incremental CAPD. Um, one person raises a question about um, people with fast peritoneal solute transport. And can we successfully um, achieve uh, targets in this group, and how long can you keep a potential person with rapid transport status on a low dose CAPD? So, the problem with rapid transport status, of course, is fluid reabsorption. And if you're using two exchanges for your incremental PD, you're going to get reabsorption of the um, 1.36 um, dextrose, and sometimes even the 227. Uh, and um, and patients will become edematous even with reasonable urine output. So in those patients, you really need to use like a dextrin um, for at least one of the exchanges. Uh, so so we we would uh, give them you know six hours say with the one three six and then they put in like a dextrin for the rest of the day. Uh, so we, we we tend I mean I tend to regard starting on CAPD almost rather than APD almost as a, as an incremental type of prescription um, because a lot of people don't want to sleep with a machine uh, and is is quite off-putting for for some patients 
um, particularly if they're getting a, a lot of alarms. Uh, right. So I guess yeah, I guess what you're saying is icodextrin might be one strategy from a volume perspective to allow a rapid transporter to continue to do CAPD. That's right. Okay. Um, this is for both of you. I'm going to get both of your perspectives because this is a common question that I get asked as well. So you start somebody on five or six days a week and they get used to it and they're comfortable and they're happy. And then you say, okay, well, residual kidney functions decline, blood work doesn't look so great, volume may be a challenge, it may, it may be important to move to seven days a week. And people have this fear with incremental that people will be reluctant to increase the prescription or even continue to do five or six days a week despite our um, suggestion that they may benefit from seven days a week or more days a week. Um, how do you respond to that concern about um, incremental? Maybe we'll start with you, Peter, and then Edwina. Couple of comments. Yeah, I do see that. Uh, the first thing I think you should always tell people at the start that you will likely have to change their prescription uh, as time goes by and as their kidney function goes away. So you do tell them that. Of course, they'll forget or they'll say, I don't remember, or even if they do remember, they'll still say, I don't want to do the extra day. I see it most often with the introduction of a day dwell in cycler patients. So they manage on day dry for two years and you introduce a day dwell and they don't like it. And it can be a real struggle some, in some patients. And you start, you start maybe go, reducing the day dwell from two liters back to one liter or one and a half and you negotiate and it can be, can be a challenge. But you know, to me, that's not a reason not to do it in the first place. It's like saying, you know, should, should I have you miserable all the time, uh, right from the start, or should I give you a break and then make you a little miserable later? Dialysis isn't fun, and uh, I recognize this, and we have to recognize it. So I'd rather give them whatever break I can for as long as I can, and accept that sometimes it will be a challenge, that psychologically it may be difficult to go up on, um, to go up on, the, on the dose. Mostly we manage, but the occasional patient, especially, uh, well, not the occasional patient just struggles with the day dwell when you introduce it later. I do, I do agree that happens sometimes. And you have to settle for maybe two smaller day dwells, uh, mm -hmm. uh, one for eight hours and one for five hours, whatever. Um, these are the approaches. Again, everybody's different. It needs to be patient-centered and shared decision-making, and they have to share in the challenge with you. Edwina, what would you... Well, I, I tend to agree with Peter. I mean, it's, it's an ongoing conversation. Right. Uh, so that, uh, right from the start, they know there's going to be changes as residual kidney function goes down. Um, and, and I give people options. Um, yeah. And say, do you want to go up to, you know, three exchanges or four exchanges, five days? Or do you want to do three exchanges, yeah. seven days? Um, do you want to change, you know, etc. So they feel part of the, and, and the other thing is you can say, let's try it for two weeks and see whether there's any difference. Um, and right. then when they get better, um, they'll, they'll stay on it. Uh, yeah. so, and say yes, but still, you know, once a month, you can have a day off. Um, yeah. So, yeah. I, so think, it's, I think those are important it's, points. Yeah. Um, no, those are important points, um, really important. And I like the idea of setting expectations early on. I like Peter's idea, you know, of not burdening patients because of the fear that they won't increase the dose down the road. Uh, so thanks for the answer to that question. Um, one thing that one thing that I wanted to ask, uh, and this comes up a lot, is um, people who are doing well with a KT over V that might be low, but are otherwise doing well. Uh, what would you both say, we'll start with Peter, uh, about increasing the dose just on the basis of KT over V alone? So I would have different responses depending on the person. Again, I'll take two extremes. Uh, if I had a person who's on the kidney transplant list, who's young and really healthy, I'm going to err on the side of being a little more aggressive there. Say, look, the evidence isn't very strong, but there is some evidence that higher KT and V up to some degree at least, is better than lower KT and V. Not great evidence, but there is some. And I'd say I would, I would push them to try and go up above the 1.7. It's a bit arbitrary, but if they could, with a reasonable prescription, I would do it. If, on the other hand, it was an elderly, frail person and they were actually doing well, 
I would not do that. I would have negotiated with them, or even in my own head, a lower goal clearance to begin with. The clearance goal in them is whatever keeps them reasonably well. Uh, it's not really a number necessarily, it's a clinical picture. And Edwina did describe this earlier, the clinical assessment, the overall assessment. So if I feel, and if the nurse, who's often knows the patient much better than I do, uh, feels that the patient is genuinely doing well and the patient and the family are doing well, I'm not going to fiddle with 1.5 or 1.4 to, to, to meet a, a target that is not a high level, supported by high level evidence. So I, I would, and so you might say now that's not incremental PD. Yes, it might reach a stage where I no longer have a, an intention to increase because the goal target's already reached. So it, the definition can get a little blur there. But no, I wouldn't necessarily increase in a frail older person. And in between, there's, there's a mix of compromises, you know? You, uh, and I think, again, it's paying attention to the individual patient and not treating them like they're all the same. Edwina, how would, would you comment? Well, I, I, I agree entirely with, with Peter. I think more of a challenge is when you've got to your the top goal or the absolutely top prescription, and somebody's still not doing well, or we, and you're still not getting, adequate, you know, a reasonable small cell nucleus. Their biochemistry is still um, not good, particularly those on a transplant list, uh, who you don't want to be called in for a transplant and then turned away because their figures are so bad. So, um, in those sort of people, is how do you get them then to agree to change the hemodialysis? I think that that's can be quite a challenge. Um, I, I've got one young man at the moment who's really keen not to go on to hemodialysis um, on a huge APD prescription. And, uh, and, and often then I will say, you really not have a live donor? And it's amazing how often a live donor comes forward when you're threatening um, to change the hemodialysis, as has with this particular young man so um yeah and, and maybe could, could, I, could i comment a little there i mean I think this is very interesting this does happen sometimes i mean there's more to your health on dialysis than clearance people have other illnesses people have depression people have all sorts of issues fatigue tiredness not doing well definitely uh i do sometimes switch there are some people who just don't do very well in pd and i do switch them to hemo sometimes but often they won't be doing well in that either. Uh, some, there are other conditions sometimes that no amount of KT and V will solve. I think one of the great vanities of nephrologists 10, 20 years ago was that KT and V could solve everything. And some still behave as if that's true. I don't think it is. But you a trial, as, as Edwina says, sometimes a trial of higher KT and V. And if it doesn't work, go back to the more tolerable prescription. Yeah. And somebody asked, and I'm just going, in the interest of time, I want to see if we can rapid fire some of these last few questions to get as many in as possible. We're a little bit over, but I'm going to go for another four minutes, if that's okay. Someone asked about a high blood urea level and increasing the dose. I think the answer is very similar to that that this, the um, Peter and Edwina provided around KT over V. I would say that, and I would say that we would consider that sort of the same issue. Um, one person asks about um, evidence that incremental PD improves technique survival, or uh, in general, uh, randomized control trial or other high level evidence about incremental PD. And I think, Peter, you touched on one randomized control trial that was published. Um, do you want to just sort of summarize what we know in terms of what evidence exists and perhaps what evidence we should develop? Well, uh, there is, I, I can really, in searching the literature, find only one randomized trial, and it never used the word incremental PD. It was published only two years ago in, uh, in one of in, uh, uh, the PDI journal, um, and it was a, a CAPD trial. Half the patients in China, half the patients, I think there was 150, half were randomized to three cycle, three uh, dwells a day, and the other half to four dwells a day, and uh, followed up for two years. And it was an incremental PD trial because there was a full intention to increase people who were getting it three times, three dwells a day to four, if their KT and V dropped below, I think, 1.7, or if they developed symptoms. And indeed, about 20% of the patients in the 
three two liter bag uh, arm of the trial did get increased during the two years. So it was real incremental PD with intention to increase. And there was no difference in outcomes except in one area, and that was uh, peritonitis. It was less in the three dwells a day CAPD patients. Uh, makes sense. Well, you know, one less chance to contaminate every day, and so they got less peritonitis. No other difference. But of course, the group who got three dwells had less work to do had less burden of dialysis, less cost. So to me, it was a positive trial. Do we need to have a big randomized trial on this? Ideally, yes. But uh, until someone shows me that there's any signal of harm, I will continue to practice this. And I'm not sure anyone is going to do that trial. Great. No, that, thank you. Um, last question. I'm going to combine one question, two questions into one. Uh, maybe we'll start with Edwina. What's the role of residual kidney function and membrane uh, uh, evaluation in following a patient on incremental PD? How frequently do you do it? Should we be doing it for both? And what are some sort of general principles that we can provide here? I mean, membrane evaluation and residual kidney function are two completely different things. Um, so membrane function, I think anybody who's starting on PD uh, should really have a PET, you know, PET test done um, and, and a membrane status um, established at some point if you are planning to increase the PD prescription um, because that will give you some guidance about the best way of doing so. In terms of residual kidney function, uh, probably every three to six months. I mean, it, I mean, as a rough rule of thumb, if somebody ha has been in a pre-dialysis clinic and has been followed and you know the rate of decline of kidney function pre-dialysis, if that has been slow, so it's taken 20 years for somebody with IgA disease to develop end-stage kidney disease, then it's going to go on being slow um, once they start on PD. If their kidney function has declined very rapidly um, prior to them starting on dialysis, then it's going to go on um, declining very rapidly. And in that sort of person, you're going to want to get 24-hour um, urine collections. Or just monitor the plasma creatinine. If that goes up, they're losing residual, and if they're on a stable prescription, and you think they're actually doing their dialysis, then that means they're losing residual kidney function. No, that's great. Um, I just want to finish with just making a couple comments myself just to go through the chat. I think the point is that providing three exchanges uh, in low and middle income countries um, as a standard isn't really incremental PD in the sense that the, you know, that's really what's covered under that insurance scheme per se. Um, so I'm not sure you know, if a patient, if, for example, has no residual kidney function, is transferring to hemo, and the only thing that's covered is, you know, three CAPD exchanges a day, I'm not sure that I would necessarily call that incremental PD. Peter and Edwina, would you agree? We've tried to sort of make that distinction in the webinar. Yes, so people say this Hong Kong practicing, Hong Kong is very famous for its CAPD three dwells a day. That's the prescription that's covered. If the patient wants to do Cycler, they have to pay themselves to do it. But my understanding from some of the Hong Kong nephrologists is that they will increase to a fourth bag and it will be funded if the patient has a clinical indication, whether it's KT and V or uremic symptoms. So I think they are practicing it. But in another country, say, where everybody gets three bags and that's all that's covered and all that will ever be covered, that's not. I agree with you. Right. Well, I want to take the opportunity now to thank all of you for uh, extending your time beyond the hour uh, to listen to today's webinar on incremental PD, personalized PD. I hope all of you gain some insights that you can help in managing your patients receiving PD. I want to thank Edwina and Peter for their excellent presentations and really valuable insights. And I want to thank the ISN and ISPD for hosting this webinar and educational initiative. And as you can see on the slide here, the ISPD uh, 2022 meeting will take place in Singapore. I'm sure there'll be lots of discussion on incremental PD at that meeting and would welcome all of you to attend um, and want to look forward to extending the conversation. So thank you for your time today and uh, I hope everybody is well and stay safe.